Hello, I greet you. And as usual, I greet you in the powerful presence of the Most Holy Trinity, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Trinity lives in us, around us, everywhere. There is no place where the Holy Trinity does not exist. Everywhere, everywhere. Now, I would like to ask you a question in a friendly way. We are friends together. Can you say that you are God's friend in the presence of the Most Holy Trinity that knows everything, that knows exactly how you are? Can you say that God and you are friends together? If God were to speak to you right now, right now, what would he tell you? That you are friends together or that he is your friend but you are not his friend? Hoping this is not your case. If you are God's friend, this is the point I am trying to raise now. If you are God's friend, fine. God bless you. Continue. Persevere. But remember that, the, that you cannot remain as you are. Our friendship with God is dynamic, not static. It, our friendship, it, it's a, something characteristic of our friendship with God that in its nature it grows. It grows. Or it can grow more, of course, and it can grow less. It increases and decreases. Of course, it depends on us whether we grow in our love for God or not. God is always ready to give us his grace so that our friendship with him increases continuously. Would that our love for God increases continuously day and night, day after day. God does not suffer from mood swings, you know that. God loves each one of us with an infinite and everlasting love. These are two qualities of God's love for us. Usually here I speak about our love for God, but now I'm speaking about God's love for us. Two qualities of God's love for us is, one is infinite, there, there is no more, they can't, God can't love us more because more does not exist. He loves us in an infinite way, without any limit, and continuously. That's why I said God does not suffer from mood swings. Today he loves us because he is in a good mood, and tomorrow perhaps because he is in a bad mood he doesn't love us. God does not suffer from mood swings. God loves us always. And we can imitate him by loving him always and by loving him more and more always. Today more than yesterday and tomorrow more than today. Now, someone might ask me and say, it's a great question to some extent, I love God. But I don't know if I have a perfect love for him or not. How do you know? And I answer to those who have this difficulty that there are signs that show whether you have a perfect love of God or not. There are some extraordinary signs, such as, for example, a private revelation by God or a saint or an angel. But we leave these extraordinary signs, we leave them to God. He gives these signs to whom he wants, who, whenever he wants, it's, in, it's up to him to do that. We concentrate on ordinary means of salvation. 
We had better so concentrate on ordinary signs to examine ourselves as to our love for God. So now I am speaking not on God's love for us, but on our love for God. Today I shall mention one sign, namely that we are ready to suffer everything. Are you seeing the sign of loving perf God perfectly, eh, with a perfect love, as God wants us? And remember, please, when I say love God in a perfect way, and perfectly it means not that you don't commit mistakes, uh, but you love him, not for the reward to go to heaven, but you love him for himself. He loves us. And in return, we love him. So we have an intimate love together, an intimate friendship together. This is a perfect love of God. Now, I am asking you, or better you are asking me, if I or you have a perfect love of God. Is there any sign or signs? And I am pointing out a sign. And this is the sign, you suffer everything. To sacrifice yourself, ourselves to the end to deny ourselves completely so as not to commit any sins at all, either mortal or venial. Once somebody asked Padre Pio, you know Padre Pio and me are intimate friends, not just friends, he looks for me and I, although I am, you know, uh, making these videos on St. John Bosco, but Padre Pio is always with me continuously. Uh, well, uh, well, a person asked Padre Pio and told him, when do we deny ourselves? <laughs> and Padre Pio replied continuously, you have to, con to love God, you have to deny yourselves continuously, because we have a sinful nature. Our nature, if we leave it eh, freely, to do what it, what it wants, it will lead us to, to sin. That's why we need to control ourselves, to deny ourselves. And this is a sign that we have a perfect love of God. Continuously, this is the characteristic, continuously. Now, whoever does not commit mortal sins is living in God's grace. I am not discussing this. I am not discussing how to live in grace and when you die you save your soul. I am discussing how or speaking or explaining how to know if you have a perfect love of God because you know there, there is also an imperfect love of God and when in, with an imperfect love of God we go, we save our souls just the same. But first we go to purgatory. Precisely to acquire a perfect love of God there. And as soon as we have a perfect love of God in purgatory, immediately we go to heaven. So, whoever, I want to make this point clear as well, whoever does not commit mortal sins is living in God's grace. But if anyone living in God's grace couldn't care less, and you know there are many people who do that, they just care about not committing mortal sins, but then for them to commit venial sins, these are little things, basically. Huh? Huh? So, such a person has an imperfect love of God. If that person does not commit mortal sins, but commits venial sins. He has an, an imperfect love of God. And on, on entering eternity, as I said, he go, that person goes to purgatory to acquire from there, through our prayers, through our sacrifices, acquire a perfect love of God. Those who have a perfect love of God, then, when they leave this world, will go straight to heaven to enjoy the most holy trinity face to face forever. We can not commit venial sins. I have to insist on this because sometimes 
I regret to say, even people who should know more tells you it's not possible not to commit venial sins. It is possible by God's grace. It depends how great our love for God is. It depends on the degree, the high degree of grace that God has given us. It depends on how thirsty our soul is for God. It is possible not to commit venial sins. I am not saying that it is possible not to commit venial sins throughout one's life. A person can commit venial sins, even mortal sins, and then convert, and through God's grace, that person arrives at, a, at the state of having a perfect love of God, and then from that state onwards, he avoids all sins. Now, this is a negative part, not to commit sins, either mortal or venial. The positive is to please God, to do his will continuously, continuously. So we concentrate on doing his will rather than not to commit sins, because when you want to, commit, to, to please God by doing his will, you are avoiding sins. As if you have a room in the dark, in the dark eh? I don't fight darkness. No, I just turn on the switch and the light comes. As soon as light enters the room, darkness will disappear. So, something else as well. There, it is possible as well for some people, perhaps there are very uh, rare cases, that throughout one's life they don't commit even mortal sins. Um, I can mention, say, we have only one canonized saint, a multi saint in, here in Malta, Saint George Preca, and he did never committed any mortal sin, not venial sins, mortal sins. I can say the same thing about Saint John Bosco. Saint John Bosco never committed any mortal sins. Padre Pio, the same, never committed any mortal sins. All right. So this is something, I have to say it again. We can not commit venial sins, always by the power of God's grace. When we enter the state of having a perfect love of God, we must keep bear in mind what I am saying. We are living in a perfect love of God through God's grace, we are growing continuously in this grace, and so we avoid all, of course, mortal sins and also venial sins. Remember that to commit a venial sin, you must know beforehand that the action to be committed is a venial sin. You must know about that. And you do it with all your freedom, freely. If you don't know that some action, some particular action, what I said, is a venial sin, or you know that, but you do it unawares, unconsciously, without realizing what you are doing, that action will not constitute a venial sin. So if you would like to love God with perfect love, we must avoid both mortal and venial sins. In other words, we must love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, as Jesus himself told us, told us, I can say suggested to us, we find it in St. Matthew, the Gospel of St. Matthew, uh, chapter 22, verse 37. But in that verse of the Gospel, Jesus is suggesting to us to lead a perfect love of God all our heart, all. If there are venial sins, we are not loving God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. Anyone who might need to ask any question to me, I would very, uh, you know, very, very uh, happy to answer your queries, your difficulties. 
on what I am explaining, can post that question, his or that question, in the comment section of this video. Not only of this video, you know that by now I have made a number of videos already, so you can watch any video of mine and you can ask the question there, no problem at all. I see all questions, all, all comments that you post and I answer them according to your needs. So that is very important. You can also post a prayer if you want, perhaps some particular prayer that you like so much <clears throat> and <clears throat> even invented by yourselves, doesn't matter, we like. Eh? In this way, we can help each other to love God with a perfect love together and then one day we shall be in heaven together. Now, I shall pass on to St. John Bosco. I mentioned today's video as St. John Bosco and Don Antonio Cinzano. When I say Don, it means in Montes we say Don, eh? father, father. Antonio Anthony, Father Anthony, Cinzano, his surname, Cinzano. Now, we are going to the 6th of March, 19, 1870. It means 150 years ago. Eh? 6th of March, 1870. It was the first Sunday of Lent, something to be expected in March for Lent, to be somehow during Lent. It was the first Sunday of Lent. But on that day, also, St. John Bosco, the Salesians and the Oratory of Valdocco and Turin were celebrating the feast of St. Francis de Sales. On this great feast for St. John Bosco and all the Salesians, St. John Bosco received some depressing news. Don Antonio Cinzano died on that day. Don Cinzano was the parish priest of Castelnuovo d'Asti. We have met this, this village before. Asti is one of the big and beautiful cities of the region of Piedmont. All right, along with Cuneo, Alessandria, Turin itself, which is the capital of the, of the region of Piedmont. Now, Asti. So, Asti is one of the biggest cities in, in, in the Piedmont region. <clears throat> and around it, there are a number of villages. Together, they form the province of Asti. Now, one of these villages is precisely Castelnuovo d'Asti. Today, it's not called Castelnuovo d'Asti. Today, it's called Castelnuovo Don Bosco. Because there, in that village, Don Bosco was born. He was born in Becchi. Becchi is a zone in Castelmovo d'Asti, in Becchi. And so Don Bosco became renowned and for his many miracles he did, his uh, work with all people, but especially with the youths. <clears throat> and today it's called after him, eh? Castelmovo Don Bosco. But at that time, and Don Bosco was still alive and uh, it was called Castello Vodasti. <clears throat> and this parish priest, Don Antonio Cinzano, was the parish priest of uh, this village. He died at the age of 66, young age, but 150 years ago. Life was not as long as today. We used to, uh, I mean, people used to die younger than today. He served. So this Don Cinzano, he served as a parish priest of Castelnuovo d'Asti for 36 years. During the last two years on earth, he talked about his preparation to meet the Lord. You know, he got old, so old uh, for his age today. We don't call him old, 66, but at that time, 150 years ago, over 60 was an old person. And, uh, he was always ready to leave with great joy and meet the Lord as soon as he calls, called him. He was no longer parish priest of Castelmovo d'Asti, but settled in Valdocco, in the Valdocco Oratory, where Don Bosco used to live as well. And uh, with the other Salesians, of course. He was very happy there, spending his last days 
spending his last days, not only with Salilius and with Don Bosco, but also, he said, under the mantle of mere help of Christians. Now we shall see why and how. And from under this mantle, he would live for eternity, where he would see Mary, the Virgin Mary, of course, face to face forever. These words were on his lips until a few days before he departed from here. You know that as far as possible, I don't use the verb die or died or death, because in reality we don't die, we, 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 we pass on, we move as when we are at the airport, eh? at the departure lounge, we depart. We depart, all right, our body finishes, dies, and so on. And, but then we acquire another body later on. But our soul continue to live. Our souls continue to live. So much so that we know when we depart from here, if we are in heaven, if we are in hell, if we are in purgatory, we know everything. So that proves that we are still alive. Now, one year after the gilded statue of Our Lady was placed on the dome of the church dedicated to Mary Help of Christians in Valdocco, someone climbed on this dome to kiss the gold-plated feet of the statue of Our Lady on the dome. So, Don Bosco first be, when after setting up the oratory in Valdocco, he built a church dedicated to St. Francis de Sal, to whom he had a great devotion. But later on, he wanted to build another church, a much bigger church, to mere help of Christians, to spread the devotion to the Virgin Mary under this title, Mary Help of Christians. And he built it in Valdocco, near the oratory in Valdocco. Now, this was in 1867, the episode I am narrating today. The church was built, but it was not yet consecrated. It was consecrated on the night of June 1868, eh, on the next year, please. We are in 1867, and, uh, but still, in 1867, the church was built. It was not consecrated. The church was built. The dome was there as well. And on the dome, they put the statue, gilded statue, you know, covered with gold, gilded statue of Mary, of the Virgin Mary on top. And that's why he said, I mean, Don Antonio Finzano said that he would depart from here into eternity from under the mantle of the Virgin Mary because on top, the Mary, Mary had a mantle there in the statue. Eh? So to say, that mantle covering the dome and the church and all the people living under it. So, that was. And someone, I said, decided to go not on the ceiling of the church, on the roof, sorry, on the roof of the church, but on the dome where there was the statue and kiss the feet of the statue of Our Lady, it means. And who was this person? It was precisely Don Antonio Cenzano. And now we shall say why he did that. And this happened three years before he died. I said that right at the start. He died in 1870, so this was in 1867. Don Antonio Cinzano had a great esteem for St. John Bosco. First of all, Don Cinzano was the parish priest of Castel Nuovo d'Asti, the birthplace of St. John Bosco. 
Not when St. John Bosco was born, he became the parish priest later, but he had to do with St. John Bosco, now we shall see. As a matter of fact, as I told you, St. John Bosco was born in Becchi, in Castel Movodasti. Today, as I told you, it's called Castel Nuovo Don Bosco. So the Don Cinzano had been the parish priest of the village where Don Bosco was born for 36 years. It was uh, Don Antonio Cinzano himself who put the cassock for the first time on St. John Bosco in autumn 1835. So Don Bosco, I'm not going to enter it, I, I made other uh, videos on it. But you know that the first idea, Don, Bo the, he, oh, he always, Don Bosco always had the idea of becoming a priest. The idea was whether a friar or, or a diocesan priest. First, he decided to become a Franciscan. But then, you know, I'm not entering into it, I covered that in another video. He changed his mind and entered the seminary. And he entered the seminary in 1835, in autumn, 1835. And at that time, in the parish priest of Castelnuovo d'Asti was precisely Don Antonio Cinzano. And he put him, I mean, he put on Don Bosco the cassock for the first time. Because at that time, as soon as a person entered the seminary, he put on the cassock, all right, as a, of a priest. There were no, uh, there was no clergyman at that time. Don Cinzano was one, besides, Don Cinzano was one of those who greatly helped St. John Bosco to continue on his priestly vocation. And also about the rare mission he had from God. He knew that there was something special in Don Bosco, that he couldn't see it in other priests, in other seminarians. Now, why might ask, but why Don Cinzano climb on the dome of the Church of Mary, help of Christians in Valdocco, Turin, in order to kiss the feet of the statue of Our Lady on the dome? And the answer is the following. Don Antonio Cinzano was getting older and older. Remember, 150 years ago, they considered over 60s as old people, although he died at the age of 66. He was getting older and older, and with old age, he became almost deaf. He couldn't hear anymore. He heard little or nothing, almost nothing, more often than nothing. He could be described as a deaf person. This problem of hearing forced him to cut himself off from society. You understand, if you are hard of hearing, you don't hear, uh, people won't come to speak to you. And so, little by little, everyone would, uh, you know, uh, stay apart from you, uh, from people, because he ended up not being able to speak to others, because he could not hear their answers. In addition, he also feared that someone might abuse him in some way because of his lack of hearing. But his greatest regret, you can understand this, but his greatest regret was the fact that he could not continue with his pastoral work as before. A deaf priest is very limited in his pastoral work. He couldn't continue as before. He could not continue with his ministerial work as a priest. This has caused him great distress. Don Cinzano went to several medical doctors to cure him, but it was all in vain. We must remember that 150 years ago, the medical science of that time was not as advanced as it is today. He had a vice parish priest, and this vice parish priest one day went to uh, Valdocco Oratory, where Don Bosco was living, and told him about these difficulties that 
Don Antonio Cinzano was encountering on account of his, you know, uh, lack of hearing, and explained to him how much he was suffering from his deafness. St. John Bosco, calmly, smilingly, as he used to be and to, be and to do, St. John Bosco suggested a novena. A novena. He is deaf? Okay. Tell him to pray a novena to Mary, help of Christians. When Antonio Cinzano learned what St. John Bosco had suggested to him to do, he gladly accepted to make that novena and had a great confidence that Our Lady could heal him. His trust was not in vain because Our Lady interceded for him before her son Jesus and obtained the miracle Don Cinzano desired so much. As a matter of fact, the miracle took place on the 2nd of October 1867. On the 2nd day, all right? October 2, 1867. 1867. That morning, on the second day of October, so 1867, that morning, before Don Antonio Cinzano left the presbytery where he lived to go to the parish church to celebrate Mass, he scolded the maid of the presbytery because she spoke to him in a low voice and Don Cinzano thought she was speaking in a low voice so that he would not hear what she was telling him. So he got angry with her and she ended up weeping, of course. Patience has to be exercised by everyone, even by priests. Even priests need to be calm, need to be patient. They don't have to be enraged for any reason whatsoever. God wants that from them as well. As a matter of fact, once I heard a very renowned person, let me say person, who said when uh, one does not have any mortal sins to, con to confess, they confess destructions in prayer and lack of patience. Now, now this is just within brackets, so to say. Uh -huh. Now, that morning, so, that morning, on the second day of October, 1867, Don Antonio Cinzano went to church to celebrate Mass. When the parish priest arrived in church, he asked our lady again to be healed, to be healed. Remember, he went to church in Castel Movodasti, eh? not in Valdocco, eh? where he was parish priest. In, Valdo, in Castel, Castel Movodasti, he went there to the parish church there. And um, he asked our lady so to be healed again. He asked her with great confidence and hope. In church, he also asked Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament for forgiveness, eh, to forgive him for the impatience he showed with the maid at the presbytery before he left. So he understood that he did wrongly. Of course, we cannot judge anyone. We, let, we have to be you know, have compassion with everyone and pray for everyone, leave judgment to God, not to us. But we have to preach what is good to be done and what is evil to be avoided. Impatience is evil, it's not something good. So, Don Antonio Cinzano arrived there and he asked Jesus to forgive him for what he had done. Then he entered the sacristy put on the sacred vestments and went out to celebrate Mass on the high altar. His altar boy was Cesare Cagliero, a 13-year-old altar boy. 
Now, this Cesare Cagliero, at this episode, he was only 13 years old. Later on, became a Salesian priest. And later, a procur procurator general of the Salesian congregation. Now, I have to remind you, or tell you, if you are young, that 150 years ago, so before the Second Vatican Council, and how, Mass was in Latin. And each priest that went to celebrate Mass had with him an altar boy. Altar girls were not accepted at that time. An altar boy. And the altar boy was there to help him, not just in doing, you know, some actions, uh, like changing the missile from one side of the altar to the other, uh, and so on and so forth, or help him to wash his hands, and so on and so forth. He needed to know, to answer certain prayers of the Mass in Latin. In Latin. For example, Mass started, the priest would say, in Troibo ad altare dei. And the altar boy used to answer, ad deum qui letificat juventutem mea. In other words, in English, in Troibo ad altare dei. I enter to the altar of God. Uh, to God, ad deum, to God, qui letificat, who rejoices, eh, my youthhood. And um, so this altar boy was there with Don Antonio uh, Cinzano to help him as usual. He helped him even before, on other days before, and this time on the 2nd of October 1867, he was there to help him as well uh, in, in answering and helping in, in his celebration of the Mass. And, uh, of course, this Cesare Cagliero, this altar boy, knew that Don Antonio Cinzano was deaf and began to answer the words in Latin in a very loud voice. So that Don Cinzano would know that he was answering him because there used to be priests, even if they didn't hear the altar boy answering, they would get enraged. And so, no, priests shouldn't get enraged. Shouldn't, all right, they are human beings as well. But God wants them to remain patient. They answer, I mean, they, they can correct a person, all right, but sweetly, lovingly, for the love of God. Now, Unlike the previous days, Don Antonio Cesano was angry again here now and scolded the altar boy, saying, you are deafening me with your loud voice, because the altar boy was, of course, answering in a loud voice, because he knew that Don Cesano was, was deaf. But what was happening is something mysterious. Why? Because Don Cesano, after hearing the loud voice of the altar boy, told him, you are deafening me with your loud voice. Do you think I am deaf? When you answer the prayers, answer them in a low voice. Don Cinzano was not yet aware that he had already obtained the miracle and recovered his hearing. But on speaking for some time to the altar boy, Don Cinzano realized that he has received, he had received the miracle and could hear everything in a normal way, as if he had never lost his hearing. When he realized that he had healed, he exclaimed, I'm hearing, I'm hearing, I'm hearing everything. Then and then he left the altar, and then there the sacristy, because he was so excited that he couldn't continue the Mass. As he entered the sacristy, he burst out saying, I am hearing, I am hearing, Maria Auxiliatrice, that is, Mary Help of Christians, has obtained for me the grace of healing my deafness. At the same time, he decided to go to Turin, 
remember this, the miracle happened in Castelnuovo, that's it. So he decided to go to Turin from Castelnuovo and thank Mary there in her sanctuary of Valdocco. Now, the miracle took place on the 2nd of October 1867. What happened, as I told you, the, although the church was not yet consecrated, but the church, the building of the church, the dome and the statue were already there. Don Antonio Cinzano, so, entered the church, of course. He thanked Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Of course, there were statues or paintings of the Virgin Mary in the church of Valdocco. And he thanked Mary there. But he was not satisfied with that. He was not happy to thank Our Lady in church only, but he wanted to climb on the dome, kneel down and kiss the, the feet of the statue of Our Lady. You who are listening and me, one day in heaven together shall be, always by the power of God's grace.